Um, we're going to have a few things before I even come here. This is kind of the outline of what's going on today. Chris is going to, we're, is going to introduce you to this concept of the bird genomes and you. Uh, keeping your mind, we'll have a bit of a bio refresher. So this happened afterwards, but start thinking right now, all the way back to bio 101, what a transcript used to look like, and those kinds of things, so that you start soaking yourself in what we're doing for annotation. Then Morgan is going to come after Chris and going to tell you a little bit about automated annotation and a little bit of the concept of getting into the need for manual annotation, and then uh, you'll have about two hours with me where we're going to do a powwow about manual curation. I'll first walk you through every detail of what Apollo is, and then uh, I'll give you an example of how I think when I'm conducting a manual annotation exercise, and then it's your turn to have fun, and I have uh, some exercises prepared for you. After they are done with their talk, you'll receive an email with the exercises for when we're done with my talk. Uh, I won't do it before, so you don't start peaking and uh, losing interest. And I will not share my slides with you until after, so you don't start peaking and losing interest. <laughs> so. All right, bird genomes and you. So I was, I guess it's safe to say I, I have an identity crisis. Uh, I still think of myself as a field biologist, even though mostly what I do is mess around with genome and genomic data now. So, but I am very, uh, what Benny mentioned earlier, I am very serious that I think all of you can and should do the stuff if you're, if you're interested in it. And so what I wanted to do today is start to warm you up a bit about where we are with bird genomes and some of the things we can do with bird genomes and hopefully convince you that there's something in here that is of interest to you. Because like, for example, the annotation stuff we're gonna talk about, what we're hoping to do is gather, you know, you all together to help us in this effort. Um, because we can't, it, it won't work if it's just a few of us uh, trying to do a, a whole genome or multiple genome annotation. So part of what I want to do is convince you that this is interesting and fun and you can get, you'll, you'll get something out of it. And the other thing I want to do is just give you the background to warm, just give you a feel for where we are these days. So uh, the first thing I'll talk about is a, a brief history of bird genomes. And then really tell you what it means to have a sequence genome now and hopefully how we're trying to change that uh, and improve that going forward. And then I'll just highlight a few studies about the different kinds of questions people are asking of uh, conducting uh, using bird genomes and genomic type data. So the history. The history, of course, of bird genomes starts with the chicken. The, the, the first bird genome sequenced in 2000. For, I think our only uh, uh, participant that is on here is, is Wes. Is that true? Anyone else on this paper? But Wes, of course, is uh, a pioneer in bird genomes and still is actively, has been actively involved, I think, in all of the bird genomes that I'm going to talk about right here in the beginning. Um, so the chicken was the first genome, obviously, because of its importance in agriculture, um, but also the chicken has been a, a developmental, um, a model for developmental biology and immune biology for a long time. Uh, and then in 2010, uh, we sequenced the songbird genome, and now there are a few more of us uh, that are on this. And the reason the songbird, the, the zebra finch genome was sequenced, uh, we sold it as the songbird, as we tend to do with genomes, but as because of this uh, vocal learning behavior that uh, songbirds are known for. So songbirds, uh, uh, in order to learn their song, they, they they, uh, they basically copy the song of their parents. Uh, so song is a, a learned behavior, much like it is in humans. And we talk a lot about that in this paper. And of course, one of the things that excites me and Morgan and a lot of the people here about mannequins is a, is a sub ossine contrast with the ossines, the songbirds. So you have this transition in learning behavior and how did that happen? So one of the reasons the mannequin has been uh, the the golden collared mannequins so far have been uh, uh, pushed uh, uh, in the development of genomic resources. But we do have these two clades uh, that represent uh, a transition in this interesting behavior. And so that's just this past year then, we had this amazing explosion. Hopefully most of you have noticed or, or, or uh, and even read some of this stuff. But 
uh, this past year, another 48 genomes were added to uh, our repertoire, representing really the diversity of birds. And this is led by Eric Jarvis and, and BGI. And, uh, and, and so this is a huge, huge step forward for us. Uh, as someone who's been doing sort of molecular things for a long time, uh, when I was doing like mitochondrial DNA in graduate school, you know, you can sequence whole mitochondrial genomes. And birds were really like lagging relative to some of the other systems, the fish and mammals in terms of how many mitochondrial genomes we have. But here, this has pushed birds. Up. We have 50 bird genomes. It's great. So we're we're sort of we're leaders now in in sort of um, genomes of non-model systems. So it's a uh, it's it's a pretty exciting time. And now genomes are really within the reach of all of us to look at our uh, our. Um, study organisms that we might be interested in. And this, this next paper kind of highlights that. This is a one, another one that came out with a canary genome. And you'll probably notice that the author list is dr dropped dramatically. All of a sudden, there's a paper here with, you know, like 15 authors or 10 authors, whatever it is. So you, these people sequence their own genome. And turns out it's a really good genome. Um, and so you can, if you have species of interest in a few thousand bucks, you can start to think about sequencing genomes that you are interested in. And, um, and so I think this, that's really exciting. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so the time is right for doing genomics in weird birds, <laughs> which you might be interested in. But at this point, I think it's also really important to, for, for those of you who haven't looked at these data and haven't uh, spent time doing this, to, 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 I wanted to make it clear what we're talking about. We're talking about a, a completely sequenced genome. Um, and so, namely, the idea is that it's not, uh, <laughs> the, when we talk about complete genomes, we're not yet at the point where we actually have complete sequence of genomes. So it's sort of a misnomer to say you have a whole genome sequence. The first thing, to remember is how we actually go about sequencing genomes. And this is, this again, for some of you that do this stuff, this is really boring, um, and you know this, and have thought about this for a long time, but I wanna get everyone, the main goal here is to get everybody on the, on the same page. So how do we actually sequence a genome? It's sort of funny when you think about it, and sort of ridiculous, but the way we sequence genomes still is we break the genome up into tiny, tiny pieces, and then we have to put it all back together again, right? So you have, you have chromosomes, they're all nice and long. Mm -hmm. Ideally, you could read from one end of the chromosome to the other, except that you can't. You can't do that yet. So the way genomes have been sequenced since the human genome was sequenced, all the way up until now, is breaking the genome into tiny pieces, and then you have to try to put that puzzle back together. And it turns out that's really difficult to do. And so most of what, the, you know, a lot of what bioinformatics and what genome uh, uh, assembly efforts have spent time on is dealing with that problem of how, once you batch the genome into tiny pieces, how do we put it back together properly? And that's why we don't, when we say we have a complete genome, we mostly do not have complete genomes. There are parts of the genome that are difficult um, to reconstruct, and there are parts of the genome we can re reconstruct pretty well. As Wes mentioned yesterday, sex chromosomes. <laughs> So in birds, we've sort of, except for chicken, we've mostly ignored the W set um, because it's hard. We can't really do it efficiently and easily and cheaply yet. So we have Z chromosome sort of, but not W chromosome for most of them. So you can see how that, that might be an area where some effort should be put. Uh, a second thing I should probably remind us of here are Again, this sort of reflects on the, the technology. Uh, how, how were these different genomes sequenced? So um, the original sequencing method that most people use for, um, for say, the chicken genome and for this, much of the zebra finch genome are, are what's called Sanger sequencing. And so these are, these are read, so you're reading, again, you've broken the genome up into tiny pieces, then you're trying to do these, uh, reconstruct it from these short sequencing reads. The original short sequencing reads were not that short, maybe 500 base pairs to 1,000 base pairs. So say, we could call that for now medium-sized puzzle pieces when we were sequencing the chicken genome and the zebra fish. 
with new sequencing technology, we get many more reads of smaller size. So you can think of a puzzle with lots more pieces of small size. So for things like all of those, those 48 bird genomes, the technology we've used is this short read sequencing, next generation sequencing, as, as, the, as it's called. Um, so we've gone from 1,000 base pair reads to 100 base pair reads, and we have to put those back together. So in some ways, and so we've traded off sequencing length with sequencing amount, and that causes new sets of problems. This is a, uh, how do we work the lights here? So this is a figure from that, this is just a figure from that canary paper. And I, this, I wanna make, I'm just making the point again uh, about the, um, that where we are with genome sequencing and how genomes are not yet fully complete. So what's, what's shown here is a bunch of different genomes um, in circles. So this is the canary genome in the middle because they're trying to highlight how good their genome is. And there's the zebra finch genome in the next circle um, going outwards. And these, these various blocks show chromosomes. And really, the, the how solid these blocks are is sort of an indication of how continuously assembled, how well assembled each chromosome is. So you can actually see for some of the old genomes, like uh, zebra finch and uh, chicken, we have nice uh, uniformly colored blocks, which means those chromosomes are relatively well put together. And even this canary genome is really is pretty nice. Uh, Wes was talking yesterday about these N50 scores and things like that. So we can quantify this. I'm not really going to get into that. But with some of the, with the new genomes, actually, like I said, we've traded off cost, so they're a lot cheaper. But so far, the genomes are, in general, worse than some of the old genomes. So this is something we can work on and we can improve on. And there's ways to do that now. So again, it's exciting. But, but to get, and the question is, how far do we want to go, right? For some projects, you know, a $5,000 uh, inexpensive genome might be enough for your question. For other, que other questions you might have, if you want to uh, study something on the W chromosome or study some, some particular part of the genome in extreme detail, uh, you might want to invest that extra money to, to make a beautiful genome. So that's something to think about uh, in your um, study organisms. So I just want to mention this briefly, but We've again had another sort of technology change or a complementary technology added. So I mentioned these changing read lengths, and that's important. So there are now technologies to give us really long reads. So this is one example of it, Pacific Biosystems. Um, and what people are doing who want to make really good, high quality genomes that are well put together is adding this technology on top of some of those short read technologies, or even just using this technology exclusively. This technology comes with another trade-off, is that there are higher error rates in the, in the DNA sequence, but you get huge long reads over 10,000 bases in length, things like that. So that again gives you bigger puzzle pieces and helps you put together the, the genome a little bit better. I know this is a super cool one, and this, this might be, uh, this might be uh, uh, exciting for some of you. Uh, people who do, do, do work in the field. This is a DNA sequencer uh, from a company called Oxford Nanopore. People are pretty excited about this. It's not, this is one of those technologies that's not quite ready for prime time seemingly for the last like two years, but people have these now. So this is the DNA sequencer and you plug it into your uh, laptop and you load your sample on there and it just sequences. And so, and so you can take, and the idea that, and these are, the, the idea is that these are gonna be inexpensive, so like a thousand bucks or something like that. Uh, and you can bring them into the field with you, and you can sequence things in real time in the field. So I have one of these now. They had a they had a they had a program where you could you could um you could be sort of a guinea pig and try to mess around with it. And so I have one that I'm supposed to mess around with. I haven't done this. <laughs> but the, this is another one of these technologies that's uh, so it's a nanopore based technology, which means it's it's you're literally like pulling the, the DNA through a tiny little hole. And it's reading it as it goes through. So this is another technology that's supposed to give you longer reads and help you build genomes uh, at, at, without having to deal with this assembly problem as much as what we had to do in the past. So, so this is 
So this is, you know, this is um, this is super exciting, and hopefully, hopefully, this and, and uh, the Pacific Biosystem stuff people are doing already. This this is just now starting to gain some um, popularity, but it's not even really. I don't even think they're. Only, you know, they're not selling these yet. These are still all in testing uh, or west. Yeah. yeah. So the, this is the future, hopefully. Okay. Any questions? I have a good question. Yeah. Um, why is it? Is, is that always a trade-off? Longer reads and higher error rate? I mean, so far. <laughs> and so far, it. Um, so far, yes, it's a so far yes, it's a trade off. But some of these, like the the Oxford Nanopore one, they're working to get those error rates down. But they're still high. well, partly, you know, with Illumina reads, you get so many reads that you can correct the errors that exist. So if you have at any position in the genome, you might have a thousand reads or something. So so you can even if there is an error in one of the reads, you can fix it by the errors in the of the the other reads that you sequence. And these, those long read technologies, you're typically, people aren't sequencing as deeply, so you don't have the capability to uh, correct the errors with those reads itself. So what some people do is they sequence those long reads, and then they get a pile of short reads associated with it to, to correct the errors in the long read. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now, so I wanted to, at this point, this is sort of what Moni was, I guess, referring to as sort of getting back to introductory biology and trying to make sure everyone's on the same page when we get to the annotation steps. And I'll have some of this, I'll do this briefly and Morgan might have a little bit more of this and Moni might have a little bit more of this. But I wanted to get people, one of the hardest things is, you know, it's, if you haven't sequenced the genome, if you haven't looked at any of this data, it seems abstract. It's, it's really not abstract. Like it's, you know, it's an actual chromosome, that's an actual string of letters. And you can visualize that stuff. Actually. So you can look at genomic data. People often think you can't really look at it, but you can look at it. And one way you can look at it is with genome browsers. Um, and so when for the annotation, we'll use one kind of genome browser. Um, this is another kind of a genome browser. This is a UCSC genome browser. So this is a, just a screenshot from that. Um, and this is a publicly available uh, database. So you can go to the UCSC genome browser and look at any of the genomes that are in there. Um, the zebra finch is one of the genomes that is in there. Chicken, I think Geospiza, so Darwin's finch is in there. Maybe a uh, collared flight, Phytedula is in there. Uh, there's, so there's a few birds that are, that are there to, to be looked at in a public version. And you can install, have these installed locally at your home institute and you can use them to, to look, at, um, look at your genome. So what is this? So here, in this case, we're looking at the Z chromosome. So the whole chromosome is depicted in this top little picture up there. And what's down here is a zoom in to this little chunk of the Z chromosome. And in fact, what we're looking at is a specific gene. So it's telling you where on the chromosome you are, chromosome Z, position 56,000, 56,300,000, to somewhere else. And you can display various, various features on this. And, and by the way, anyone, anyone who's looked at these can point out different things that are interesting if I don't Think, think of everything to mention. But the most, that most obvious feature here is that you have this little red thing, and that's a depiction of a gene, right? So these little rectangles here are the exons, so the coding parts of the sequence that are um, transcribed and translated into a protein. Uh, between that, with the, you have these little arrows pointing, that's the intron, so that's the part that's spliced out. Um, and then here you have a, a narrower rectangle, that's the UTR, that's the untranslated region. These are sometimes involved in gene regulation. So that, that in itself describes where the gene sits and the various parts of the gene sit in the genome. And this kind of information can really be distilled into a table. And you'll be getting to, to a feel for that a little bit later. So this what this is, is actually a table that someone has uploaded that just says where these positions are. The exon starts here and ends here relative to the genome. So chromosome Z position 56 million something is where exon 7 starts. So you can go in here and you can download a table that tells you the start and stop and where every exon starts and stops 
of every one of these, every gene in the genome. But all it is, is a table that tells you where things start and stop. And you can do that for any type of feature that you might want to show in the genome. So a gene is one kind of feature. Down here, what these are, are repetitive elements, things like transposable elements. So this is another, somewhat, there's another table someone made to show you where these features are in the genome. And there's all kinds of stuff, it, I cut off the page, but people have made all different kinds of images of describing different features in the genome. Anything else? Anyone? Questions? So most of the stuff that we do, even though it seems, you know, abstract, like I said, can be distilled into tables. RNA-seq data, gene models, you'll see our tables. Um, and so they're not as abstract as you might think. The second thing, and this is what Morgan's going to talk about uh, in more detail, is this next line. So this, this, so this is an ensemble gene. So ensemble is another database of curated gene models that describes where these genes are in the genome. What's, this one says gene scan, gene predictions. So this is what we're going to get into a little bit. When people sequence a genome, usually the first thing that happens to figure out where the genes are is an automated gene prediction algorithm is run. So the, the genome is scanned, and you look for things like, where might there be a gene? And so that, this is an example of one such algorithm that's trying to predict where there are genes. And the point of this is, is that this says, there's an exon here, and this says there isn't an exon there, right? This, this, this gene model says there are two exons here, and this one says there's not two exons there. So which one is right? Does it matter? <coughs> Those are the things we're going to, that's what we're, that's what we're trying to do here. It does matter, and I don't know which one's right. <laughs> so, so, and the way you figure that out is with data and manual annotation. So they both be right? But they could be both right. They could be both right. Yeah. They absolutely could be both right. They could be both wrong. <laughs> uh, but, there, but you can use data to validate these things. So here, what's mapped here is actually zebra finch mRNAs from GenBank. Still yet another database. So these are, these are actually data that have been mapped to the zebra finch genome and that mapping has been turned into a table, and so you can show it. And so these, this, these mRNAs support this ensemble model. So you can see that exons are consistent. But that, again, doesn't mean that this is wrong, but the data that exists in GenBank support this model. And it could be that ensemble used this data to make that model, right? So you can have purely computational predicted genes, and those can be improved and vetted by actual sequence data. And that's what we want to do with mannequins, that's what we want to do with any bird, with any genome. So. Okay. <laughs> All right, I'm taking, I'm going too slow and talking too much. All right. So I, I, what kind of data can people use to uh, improve gene models and to annotate genes and discover where they are? We can, we can use stuff like what uh, is the, the term that's probably been thrown thrown out thrown around in this workshop uh, in this uh, meeting already. Things like RNA seq. So with RNA seq, I'm not going to go into this in too much detail. You just you generate mRNA. You get it out of your tissues, so you have freshly collected tissues that have been properly preserved, and you can get mRNA out of that. You can reverse transcribe it into cDNA, and then you just sequence those cDNAs on a soup sequencer like an Illumina sequencer. So by sequencing those cDNAs, that's again, that's providing the information that tells you what, what parts of the genome are transcribed. And so those kinds of data are what results in these mRNA tracks, and we can use those to predict where the exons are. And so, yeah. How much, when that's a table like that, you look that up, how much if three different labs use the same software, the same 
technique and whatnot. How much, what is the level of repeatability? Or is there a lot of sort of within gene, within species uncertainty? So, if everybody did the same thing, would it turn out the same? Way? It's a, that's a good question. So, that's actually, I, so that's why there is some variability, right, in how, how tightly your data, how well it corresponds to these exons. So, you can, so in making RNA and converting it into cDNA, sometimes you'll get reads within these introns. And, some, and, and that's one of the reasons why purely automated methods don't seem to work that well. So you could, there are software that you can do the RNA-seq data, you can predict genes based on the RNA-seq data, and not have to look at it at all and produce a table like this. But in my experience, that doesn't work at all. So you get, it's, so there's definitely variability in how well, what, how well the data, the raw data, perfectly predict how well they predict these exons. Okay. So that's why we have this manual vetting process. Because there is gonna be, there is gonna be intronic, either contamination from genomic DNA, or uh, if, the, if the splicing hasn't proceeded, you might have precursor mRNA that still has some of those introns in there. So there, are, there, are, there are factors that so far predict, prevent easy, um, purely automated, prediction of these uh, exons. Question. Yeah. One thing to remind everybody, <clears throat> even though you have some RNA-seq data, even maybe a lot of RNA-seq data, that doesn't mean you agree with RNA-seq data because gene expression differs in every tissue. So every RNA-seq experiment will give you different genes. Yeah, and so that's that's one of the, that's a, that's a great point. And that is one of the things that, you know, there isn't, typically just one uh, isoform. So there's di different isoforms, different combinations of exons are used in different tissues. And we don't know very much about that at all in uh, birds. So one of the reasons we wanna collect all this data is to have that, in there might be uh, a, a version of a gene that's particularly important in reproductive tissue, but we don't know that because everyone has only sequenced brains and zebra fishes so far. Right, so that that that's why we need to also have data to support these models and other and alternative isoforms and things like that. And so, in an ideal situation, I think when we first met with this mannequin group at Nesson, I think Wes suggested sequencing developmental time course, all different tissues, um, and that could be something that we talk about is the data sets that we're going to need, sort of going forward, to make this make this truly comprehensive and uh, to maximize what we get out of it for the questions that we have. Chris, I was gonna add one more thing yep. to answer Jeff's question. You were asking also about coordinates between um, automated pipelines like Ensemble, mm -hmm. Maker is another independent one, uh, Santa Cruz has theirs, NPBI has theirs. My experience when you look at the list over from those different pipelines, they're pretty high with coordinates between the prediction. It's this, I'd say 10, 15 percent maybe that's challenging in all genome models or gene model predictions. And this is where the RNA seq data is so critical to try to get those. You can do lift over from chicken on almost any bird and get a majority of the genes that lift over very nice one to one on all of these, um, one model to another. It's very nice. But there's a lot of challenging variation in that 10, 20 percent or whatever it is, gene model, gene model predictions that are the ones that we really want to get, right? Mm -hmm. Many times, those are the most interesting transcription factors, things like that, that have all kinds of splice transcripts, et cetera, et cetera. So, those are the ones we want to get with RNA C data. Questions? Anything else? So, I, I think I'm going to skip this for now, but I think this is going to come up. And I think I'm going to get to sort of the fun stuff. Uh, and end on the fun stuff, which is just to give you a feel for the sorts of questions, um, the sorts of analysis, the sorts of things people are doing in their systems. And the cool thing is that in the last year, you, the, like papers that have done really cool things on natural systems have, have started to, to 
come out that use genomic data. And, and, um, so I'll just highlight a few cool things. So, all right, so this isn't a natural system, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a cool one. So actually one of our uh, uh, RCN members who wasn't able to make it, um, it's, it's a paper from Mike Shapiro's group. Uh, so he had this crazy idea of sequencing genomes of basically uh, the, all of the domesticated, domesticated and selectively bred um, pigeons. So Darwin talked about pigeons as a class as an example of you know evolution. And and it turns out there are pigeons, it turns out there are pigeons with crests like this, this guy, or Oriental Krill, um, and this English trumpeter. And then there are a whole bunch of pigeons that don't have crests. And so he wanted to know as a developmental biologist, I think that's what you call himself, is uh, what's the genetic basis of that crest? And so he did, and this has worked now in a couple of studies I, I, I'll, sh I'll show you. He did a brute force approach that, like, if I had thought to do this, like, probably most of you would say, like, this is stupid But of course, he just sequenced all of the ones that have a crest and all of the ones that don't have a crest and looked for differences in the genome between the crested ones and the uncrested ones. It totally worked. There was one difference or something like that, this thing. So, he, so there's one SNP. That was correlated. That with that was um, correlated with crest, and and it uh, leads to I, I think it leads to a, 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 a an amino amino acid shift, and it's perfectly associated, almost perfectly associated, with um, crested and uncrested phenotypes, and he could even map this. He could even um, in um, in C twos to show the where it's expressed in the development developing. Um, Crest, and basically, uh, Rick is a developmental biologist. Tell me if I screw this up. Basically, the polarity of expression is opposite in crested and uncrested birds. So it's a pretty neat result. Uh, pretty crazy that it worked. And just by sequencing genomes of two populations and comparing them to each other. And so this was, I, I, I don't remember the details, but I think this was pretty low coverage sequencing. So not that price of like $10,000 per bird, um, but just sequencing a panel of individuals at low coverage. And that's a similar approach that was also used in this a recent study of Darwin's finches, where they did almost the same thing. They sequenced genomes of big build Darwin's finches and small build Darwin's finches. They did other stuff. They built phylogenies, things like that. But again, one of the things they were interested in is the genetics of uh, build size variation. Again, they just looked for, for chunks of the genome, alleles in the genome that are at different frequencies in big build and small build. And again, they came up with a uh, not surprisingly uh, tractable set of candidate genes for this build model. So we're really starting to make a lot of headway now into sort of the genetics of ecologically relevant traits. So Chris, what exactly did they compare the transcript number? No, this is this is purely so they sequence the whole genome and they're looking at allele frequencies at every polymorphic site in the genome. And that's what was done with the, uh, the both, to, to yeah, the crested. Yep. And then and then they thought to follow up. They in the first paper they followed up by doing in situ is to look at expre expression of the candidate genes during develop during during the development of the crest. So. I think it's important to point out that if you take two species, your two favorite species, and they differ by something, you sequence them and compare them, you're not going to get necessarily such a clean answer. Not, what happened in, in the pigeons is that people selected on that gene and yep. all these different histories. So all the comparisons would just erase history. There'd be only one answer that was exactly. selected. So this is so this, this is, is really hard in just like two wild species. It is, but but also things like this where you have so so clearly this is not the same kind of simple single single. Uh, polymorphism result, but in cases where you have gene flow, uh, in which a lot of people study hybrid zones and things like that, people where you have, uh, where in cases if you have um, the exchange of genes across the hybrid zone or something like that, yet you are maintaining phenotypic differences on, on the either ends of the, the, the hybrid zone or at the hybrid zone, like is the case with the uh, Manicus hybrid zone. But the gene flow that homogenizes most of the genome is not homogenizing those, those traits that are, that are fixed in the two populations. 
So think even natural processes like gene flow help us out and enable things like discovering um, discovering candidate genes, even in cases where you don't have selective breeding. There's no question that 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 the fact that there is that single mutation is facilitated by the fact that it's captive breeding and, and the movement of that that allele by captive breeding from population to population. But we can see, I mean, it's not, not hopeless in natural populations. If you have hybrids. And if you have hybrids. Kind of natural experiment. And all birds hybridize, so. <laughs> <laughs> of course, you know, this is on the other end of the spectrum. This is the, uh, one of the major results from the, the, the genome sequencing. Um, so this is a, a, an effort to reconstruct the phylogeny of birds. Uh, Many of you know, but maybe not all of you, the phylogeny of birds has been and continues to be, um, especially this deeper level phylogeny, uh, a, a challenge in birds. And so, you know, whole genome sequence and that type of data mm -hmm. as um, people are hopeful that will, and we've begun to make headway in, uh, in deep bird relationships. So if that's one of your interests, this is another area of uh, where people are doing some cool stuff. There's more, uh, Functional physiological things that people are doing now. This is a cool study of um, sort of uh, uh, thermal stress in juncos. So this study used RNA seq data to study how study physiological responses in birds. This is a like so I've been doing a lot of RNA seq type stuff too, and RNA seq is good for looking at these kinds of questions. What happens when a bird's exposed to a song? What happens when they're exposed to thermal stress? Things like that. So if you're interested in mechanistic physiological questions, there's a lot. There's a lot of you know, there's a lot of things we can do now that we couldn't do before. Um, infectious disease is another RNA seq based paper looking at how uh, I can't even remember what bird they looked at, but they infected birds with malaria and are are quantifying immune responses. This is another paper, just again, this one is sort of again to highlight the different kinds of things you can do. This is looking at demo, using those 48 whole genomes to look at demographic changes in bird species um, over time. This one is, is um, partially motivated with uh, conservation interests, looking at species like uh, crested ibis. Um, so if you're interested in demography, you can get estimates of historical population sizes to change over time. This method just uses single genome sequences. Some people are dubious about whether this really works or not, but you, there's, there's newer methods where you use multiple whole genome sequences that reconstruct demography and things like that. So um, another area that, uh, that might be of interest. I had to put some paper that I, I did. <laughs> so, and this is, this, is a, this is, I think, an interesting one because we actually, um, we did a manipulation in um, zebra finch cell lines. So it's, uh, <laughs> it, there actually are zebra finch cell lines uh, now. And we, we simply used a microRNA inhibitor to see what it does. And we measured the responses uh, uh, of inhibiting this particular microRNA in zebra finch cells. So this is a very controlled, very, very uh, a manipulative, manipulative gene expression um, sort of experiment in zebra print cells. So that's, you know, kind of interesting. This long, terrible title is because the, the reviewers didn't like my catchy title. But, uh, but the cool thing about this, uh, <laughs> I think it was microRNA 2954 regulates map kinase and, you know, and NR483 or something. But uh, also uncatchy. <laughs> but it's cool. So the cool thing about this microRNA, so microRNAs are short little RNAs. They're, yeah, you know, they briefly they regulate other other parts of the genome. But this is a sex-specific microRNA that's uh, uh, more highly expressed in one sex than the other. I don't even remember which one. And it responds to it is regulated when bird hears song. Um, and so it's kind of an interesting, an interesting, and it's bird specific also. So this microRNA is only in birds. So we don't know too much about it. So that's why we mess around with it in cells just to see what happens. And so the last thing is just, you know, mannequins. What are we going to do with mannequins? You know, there is some, you know, there's been a hybrid zone work so far that would qualify as genomic, and, and Barney is doing a lot of cool stuff in the, and Barney and Matt in the uh, 
um, brains and muscles of, uh, of these guys. But hopefully, hopefully some of these, these papers will um, uh, lead to inspiration about what we can do uh, with mannequins in our uh, genome. All right, questions before we move on? Yeah. So you mentioned using the genomic data to reconstruct demographic history. Mm -hmm. That used to be done with other kinds of Mm -hmm. What kind of what does this offer that we might be a better resolution? Yeah, so so that, that example I showed uh, that so that's a funny method called um, where again you're just using the polymorphism in a single genome to attempt to reconstruct history, and that I would suggest is very is coarse, and uh, but over over long periods you know since the last glaciation you can you know you can restrict general trends um at coarse resolution so has population sizes been big or small so but with population-based approaches where you're sequencing many individuals within 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 a species you have higher resolution i would say at, for more recent demographic you have much more higher resolution than those those examples that i showed so compared to but I think you both have increased resolution and you have resolution to look at different processes. So not every marker you're gonna look at is gonna be a neutral marker. So you have you, different parts of the genome will show different signatures. And so one of the things in the past is we've assumed a small number of markers are representative of the genome. And I think the more we look at, the more we find that different parts of the genome have different signatures. And so you have resolution of that in that way also. Mike, do you have, Brian? I'm wondering if it's possible that, that we share this PowerPoint presentation yep. with people. Mm -hmm. That's fine with me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right.